first chapter of Luke's Gospel records the events leading up to the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. The account from Luke for today focuses on the hope that was proclaimed to Zechariah and Elizabeth. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that day. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or alcohol. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, Hope is the promise that your people have always been given, even when things seem impossible. We know that nothing is impossible with you. Our hope is in a sure salvation that came with the incarnation of Jesus Christ to take our sins. You are our only hope. We thank you, and it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray.
comfort. And we ask that uh, you urge us by the Spirit to be your hands and feet when needed for each one of these individuals through prayer or even visitation or a phone call, Father. Uh, continue to move us. And Lord, uh, we do continue to lift up this nation as again and again we draw closer and closer to a, uh, a season of uh, voting for uh, politicians, Lord. It, it's bound to get ugly and nasty and lies and uh, deceitfulness will be uh, all, all over the place. Father, just help us to discern truth through your wisdom. And Father, uh, we know ultimately uh, it is all in your hands. You have it. You know what happens. You put in the power who you want in power, no matter how hard that is for us to battle at times and think through. Father, we just know that we can fully rely on you and your will. And Lord, uh, we do thank you. We thank you for the Christmas season, which celebrates and looks forward to the celebration of the birth of Christ. Father, the, the birth that changed the whole world, changed the, the whole salvation story. Lord, we thank you for that. And, uh, Father, we uh, come now as one body, with one voice, saying the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
So when you think about Christmas, and what I, I talked about Advent, and that's just uh, talking about the Christmas season, the first coming of Jesus. When you think about that, no? Yeah. Well, Jesus, yeah. You found me special. Yeah. Three wise men. How do you know there were just three? Anybody else? Well, Luke tells us about two other people, well, at least two other people, but two other people, and I don't know if you were listening to the reading, it talks about them a little bit. Starts with a Z. Zechariah, and his wife's name was, remember? Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now these these people were, well, Zechariah was a priest and he was, uh, he did work in the temple and such as priests do. And, but they, they were chosen to be somebody's parent. Do you have any idea who? He came before Jesus. No, not Joseph, John. Remember John the Baptist? He comes before Jesus. Well, they they couldn't have children either, uh, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Uh, and they were old and, and that sort of thing. And it, it was they were even so old that they were past the time when people had children. I'm not going to say anything about anybody here, but we have... There, when you get to a certain age, you can't have children anymore. You know that? You, you just can't just have children anymore. So, but then they were past this point, and they had no children. And, but yet yeah, God came to them and told them that they were going to have this son named John. And it's interesting because God uses people that even when they're old and even when they're young, you think God can use you? I think so. Yeah, God has plans that, and He has this plan that's already, He already knows, but yet we're in it. And who knows? We don't know what He's going to do with you guys. Well, you two that are here this morning, specifically, but I think He has something special, especially for children. We know He uses. Right? So, well, today, we're going to use you, right? What are you doing today? Yeah, you're collecting the noisy coin. And that, that is something useful for God, because that's that's given to people, anybody that you're doing anything, that is fine, right? So, it's just you two. So, hopefully you brought some money. Right? Did you bring your money?
for those that give, uh, give to the noisy collection and for these young children that, that collect it. And even though that may seem like uh, something not as important, Father, you're, you're using them. And you're using them within the church. Father, we thank you for these, these young people that will grow up to be older people. And Lord, we ask that uh, you continue to help us in, in raising them to, to know your word and your will and, and your way as parents and as a church. So we, we just thank you for all of this. And we ask your blessing upon this, this collection and, and that is used for your glory and for your gospel to go out into and, and all the world. Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. <coughs> Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife was stricken in years. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel, that standeth in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to shew thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled at he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them, and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth concealed, and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the day wherein he looked on me, to take away my reproach among men. Sends a reading to these verses.
pray together again before we get into the message this morning. Father, we thank you again for this time. And now that we come to your word, uh, and even though it is a very familiar passage of scripture, a very uh, familiar couple of chapters that we're going to be looking at, Lord, may we see, may we see these uh, with fresh eyes. May may you speak to us uh, in, in a new way as we as we look once again at this uh, at this wonderful, glorious story, this account of uh, leading up to the, the birth of Christ. Father, we do ask that uh, if anything that I say that's incorrect to be corrected, and uh, anything that I say that is unworthy of your glory may be cast out. Lord, uh, give us ears to hear and uh, minds to understand and hearts ready to take it in and be a part of our very soul, our very being. Father, we just ask your grace upon this time, and may it be your words, not mine. And I pray this in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Amen. Dr. Helen Rosevear, missionary to Zaire, told the following story. A mother at our mission station died after giving birth to a premature baby. We tried to improvise an incubator to, to keep the infant alive, but the, the only hot water bottle we had was beyond repair. So we asked the children to pray for the baby and for her sister. One of the girls responded, Dear God, please send the hot water bottle today. Tomorrow will be too late because by then the baby will be dead. And dear Lord, send a doll for the sister so she won't feel so lonely. That afternoon a large package arrived from England. The children watched eagerly as we opened it, and much to their surprise, under some clothing was a hot water bottle. Immediately the girl who had prayed so earnestly started digging deeper claiming if God said that, I'm sure he also sent a doll. <laughs> and she was right. The Heavenly Father knew in advance of that child's sincere request. <clears throat> and five months earlier, he had led a ladies group to include both of these specific articles. You know, we, we can't see what God has planned. We we don't, we don't even know what really today will bring to the rest of the day. And the beautiful thing is that God already, already knows all of it because from his perspective, all of it really has taken place. And we get to live it out in, in a real time, so to speak, as, as participants in God's sovereign plan. And that, that is why we can have certain hope. And the, the focus of today's uh, service is hope. And we have hope in the promises of God and, and knowing that they will come to pass. Advent, as I've already said, is here. And we're going to look at the, at the account of the first advent of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, Luke wasn't an eyewitness to what had gone down, what had happened, but he was a historian. And many secular historians have called him the most accurate historian of the entire ancient world. And that is even without speaking to the, to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that would be working within Luke to write God's word, to write this gospel. And Luke does start differently than, than the other gospel writers. He, he starts with a uh, promised birth, but not Jesus' birth. And in the first four verses of Luke, we, he writes uh, that he wanted to give an orderly account uh, of the things that had happened. And this orderly account was, was about what Jesus did and, and what he taught. It, but first... He writes about the promise of the one pointing to Jesus. He starts with the promised birth of John. 
Now, we, we heard this morning, and we, we see in this first chapter of Luke, in, in verse 5, that during the time when Herod was the king of Judea, we see here that uh, there was a priest named Zechariah, and he was married to a woman named Elizabeth. And these two are, are from a priestly lineage. We, we know that Zechariah was from the division of Abijah, while Elizabeth is from the lineage of Aaron, the first high priest of Israel. And now priests, as we know, we know are mediators between God and the people. Zechariah and, and Elizabeth here in this first chapter were called righteous. And it is written that they, they followed the statutes and the commandments of God. Now, they, they followed God's law. Now, they weren't perfect, and, and we'll see that uh, here in a little bit, uh, but they were faithful. And there is, there is one more thing that, that's pretty important here that we find out about these two. Uh, Elizabeth, well, even just Elizabeth, she was barren. She was childless. She had, was unable to have children. And, uh, and now, at this point, they were old. They were beyond childbearing years. And Elizabeth wasn't barren due to some punishment or cursing because of <coughs> sin. Not specific personal sin, but you know, sin was the cause ultimately, but not her specific sin didn't cause this. She was just unable to have children. And, and this, you know, when I, when I first read this about these two who are old, up in years, and barren, unable to have children, it, you know, it really brings quickly to my mind another married couple that were in a very similar situation. Um, they have a lot in common with the account of Abraham and Sarah. Sarah was also barren. And both of them were also old, past childbearing ages. They were you know, beyond that point. And now, you know, just like them, Zechariah and Elizabeth weren't able to have children. They had never had any children. And, and they were also old. Uh, and that these things are important to point out because of what comes next. Uh, Zechariah, we read here, was chosen to go into the temple and burn incense on the altar. Now, he, he was chosen uh, by casting lots. We read that in the scripture here. And it was sort of like rolling dice. Uh, he would, he, most likely, you know, we would say that Zechariah got lucky. But it wasn't luck. He, he didn't, it wasn't luck that it got him into going into the temple. That this is how they discern God's choosing. We see this quite a few times in scripture where Lots are cast to see what God desires or what his will is for someone. Uh, the rest of this account is, is pointing to this very choice of God. And we call it luck because there's a percentage of chance. Uh, what was the chance uh, that Zechariah would be chosen to go into the temple and burn this incense? Uh, R.C. Sproul, in his commentary on Luke, writes this, he says, uh, Israel had 18,000 priests divided among the different groups, and 14 priests of those 18,000 were given the privilege of offering the incense on the altar during the course of a single year. So really, the, the chances aren't great here to, to have a chance to go in and uh, burn the incense on the altar. And I didn't figure out this percentage. Uh, because, you know, it was really actually a sure thing here. That Zechariah would be the one on this occasion. God chose who went in to burn this incense. And the burning of this incense was, was to signify the prayers of the people. The rising of the smoke would be a visual representation of the prayers going up to God. And, and also, Sproul writes this. He says, prayers were offered for the nation on these occasions, both in the morning and the evening. But the vast multitude of people came in the late afternoon at dusk for the offering of these prayers. And they, they gathered outside the temple to pray and watch the smoke that came out of the temple. Because when the incense burned, 
the smoke would spiral up through the roof of the temple, and that was a signal for the people to fall on their faces in the courtyard around the temple in thanksgiving that the prayers of intercession on their behalf had been offered. And this was a, this was a time of fervent prayer of the people of Israel. And during this time is when Zechariah was visited by this angel inside the temple. And Zechariah responded just like everyone else who has experienced the presence of an angel. Seeing what we read here is the angel of the Lord. We're told that, that he was troubled and afraid, the ESV says. Uh, the angel tells him not to be afraid, like we see many times in scripture, and tells him that he and his wife were going to have a son to be named John. Now, an interesting side note is that when, when certain things were specific to be done and God is calling certain people to, for a specific, special purpose, he named them. And we might talk about that on Wednesday at Bible study, the naming of people, how that was given to parents but in certain situations, God will. If you want to find out or talk more about it, you have to come to Bible study. <laughs> so Zechariah here responds by questioning all of this based on the fact that he is old and his wife is in advanced in years. And I thought that was kind of nice of Zechariah uh, to not say that Elizabeth was also old. You know, he said she was advanced in years. At least maybe Zechariah got this part right. He did, however, as we know with many in the Bible, get something wrong. He, he questioned the word of the angel. He doubted it. And really, ultimately, when he's questioning or doubting the angel's words, it's really not just his words that he's doubting. He's questioning God's Word. He was a priest in the process of atoning for sins and praying for the people, bringing prayers of the people, and, and you know, questioning the very words of God who he's praying to. And the angel comes back with a response. He replies with telling Zechariah his name. He says, I am Gabriel. And he says, he talks about his position, how he meets with God. He is one of the those that is in the very presence of God. And he is one of the messengers coming straight from God. This is God's word. And then because Zechariah doubted it and questioned it, he would become mute until the time that this was fulfilled or this came to pass. And this again reminds me some uh, of the Abraham and Sarah account when, when Sarah laughed in the tent in Genesis 18. Uh, 10 to 12, uh, Sarah, the Lord said, I certainly, I will surely return to you about it. this time next year. Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, I, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Now we can take that wherever we want to, we're not going to dig into that, but Sarah is in the text saying, you know, there's no way I can have a son. And she left. You know, what's interesting, though, when we look at these two accounts here, now, now Abraham and Sarah were, were in the Old Testament right near the beginning of when God is forming his people, bringing his people together, or, or bringing a covenant that with Abraham, that we know that's the, the context there. But uh, Abraham and Sarah were not punished for their disbelief in what God had said. And we could maybe say, speculate on this and say that God expected Zechariah to know more. He's further along. He, he's had more revealed to him and he should know this. He's a priest. He should know that, you know, what God can do with unnatural circumstances. Uh, he's seen, he's heard of, he's read about, he knows all the miraculous dealings God had with the people of Israel and that he has done, how he has saved them, preserved them, and, and been with them. And maybe, maybe though, 
It's just because God chose to have mercy on Abraham and Sarah and to bring justice on Zechariah. It could be just that simple. After God, after all, God Himself says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So either way, it's just, it's right, it's, it's God's choice to whom to, to whomever he does what he does. The, the point is that not believing God's word really is sin. And, and any word that comes from one of God's messengers is God's word. It's not, it's not something to be taken lightly, and I don't think we should take it lightly. Belief is the foundation for salvation. And not believing God's word is dangerous and has eternal consequences. Now in this case, Zechariah's judgment it was temporary in that it would cease. He, he would be able to speak again when this promise was fulfilled and the time had come. Uh, and we see here, meanwhile, while all this is taking place within the temple, the people are outside praying. There's a multitude of people. And the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the temple. And usually after the people would see this smoke coming up out of the roof, uh, the priest would soon appear. The priest would come back out then. Well, they didn't see Zechariah. He was delayed. When he came out, he was unable to speak, and somehow the people knew that he had seen a vision. And uh, the text doesn't really explain how they knew, but, but maybe they could just see it in his face, and most likely that's a big part of it. When one expresses or experiences a traumatic vision or something, any kind of trauma, it will show. It, it does show with our expression, and uh, that could be it. But then we read uh, that it was that, that the time of his duty was over, and that Zechariah went home. Uh, and that's, you know, I guess that's it. He went home, couldn't talk, so got tired of trying to explain things. What, 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 what about Elizabeth? And we have a little short couple of verses about her. After all this, Elizabeth becomes pregnant, and she, she rejoices in the blessing even after all this time of barrenness. And, you know, I know you most likely heard about that culture at that time, and with, if you're barren, it was seen as, well, you must, there must be some sin that you've committed that, that uh, God is not blessing you with children. There's a curse, and you look down upon. But, you know, isn't it, isn't it awesome uh, that uh, God uses the very people that society many times look down on? And, he, and, he, and many times, they're the people that he uses the most, with the most impact it's, uh, for his plan. He takes what should be impossible in the natural world and brings miraculous events that change everything. And as he did, had done with Sarah and a few others, there is not just these, these two accounts, a promised child comes through barrenness. And it's not just barrenness that is in the way, but Elizabeth is past the childbearing years. She's too old. It is naturally impossible. And surely God can't bring a child to this couple who can't possibly conceive one. So the, the and the big issue here with all of this is, is that Zachariah didn't believe God's word. And that's really why he was punished. He, he did all of his duties required by law as a priest. He did all the things right. He prayed throughout, I'm sure, his many years of service. And as a priest, Zechariah would be also praying for the taking away of the sin of the people of Israel. He knew the promises that God had made through the prophets. And Zechariah probably still had this hope of God's promises being fulfilled in that aspect. You see, the, the prayers being answered here, that the angel says, your, and your prayers have been heard to Zechariah. The prayer that is being answered were more than just one specific thing here. Uh, you know, it's, it's very significant that it happened the very moment 
when the incense was being burned. This, this was to represent the people's inter intercessory prayers going up to God for their sin. And these prayers were for the atonement. And Gabriel brings God's word to Zechariah that these prayers will be answered. And the thing is, Zechariah's prayer to be blessed with offspring will also be answered. God was going to fulfill his promise through miraculous means because he doesn't go back on what he has promised. And I'm sure Zechariah and Elizabeth had prayed for children. Zechariah didn't believe the word from God. It, you know, it was too late and pretty much impossible. And he, even though he was praying for God to answer certain things, it seemed very unlikely that it could possibly happen. And have you, have we been in that situation? Is there something that you've been praying for for a long time? And sometimes it seems like, you know, we're just praying and, you know, almost like the, the possibility just dwindles as we go. And sometimes our answer comes much, much later than we expected. Sometimes in order to, for God's plan to move forward, uh, the answer may be not yet. And we must remember also that this account here in Luke chapter 1, 5 and 25 was a special part of of God's redemption plan. He isn't, he isn't going to always work in this miraculous way for every person in ways like this. This was for a specific thing at that time. And he will, however, fulfill his promises. And there are many promises within Scripture. And I'm going to read a few of them from, uh, I took this list from gotquestions.org. If, if you come to Bible study, you know I like that website. Um, God promises salvation to all who believe in His Son, from Romans 1, 16 and 17. There's no greater blessing than the free gift of God's salvation. God promised that all things will work out for good for His children. That's in Romans 8, 28. God promised comfort in our trials, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. God promised new life in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. God promised every spiritual blessing in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. God promised to finish the work he started in us, Philippians 1, 6. God promised peace when we pray, Philippians 4, 6 and 7. God promised to supply our needs, Matthew 6, 33 and Philippians 4, 19. And then there's Jesus' promises. Jesus promised rest, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Jesus promised abundant life to those who follow him, John 10, 10. He promised eternal life to those who trust him, John 4, 14. He promised his disciples power from on high, Acts 1, 8. He promised that he will return for us, John 14, 2 to 3. And at that point, we will be with him. These are promises made in God's word. This is God's word, and that we need to believe within our very souls what it says. And these promises will come to be reality, uh, and many through prayers of the people. And I know that's hard for our minds to wrap around, that these promises will be fulfilled, but also God uses prayers of the people. And, and while we still have many prayer requests bring, to bring specific healings and for certain circumstances to change, you know, may our prayers be many times focused on the fulfillment of God's promises because, in a way, the other prayers will also be answered when these promises come to pass. And when we have answered prayers, may, may we rejoice like Elizabeth's with the blessing that she got from God and continue really in our hope of the, the glorious salvation that God, that, that John here was going to play a big part in. John was coming. And this, this passage here is pointing to that fact that John is coming and he's, he's going to be pointing to Jesus. This, Luke is the only one that really gives us this account. And 
that is, that is where our focus should be as well. All our hope really is in Jesus and nothing else. And uh, may, when we pray, let us pray with hope that is certain, founded on Scripture, on God's Word, on what He said, on what He has promised, that He will make it happen. Today is the uh, focus of hope. And again, we, we are called new hope. And, you know, it's, it's such a, you know, it's such a good name. Not that this is, not that this hope is new in, in, in that it is, the gospel is old, but that there is new hope for those that need it. And we talked about that, I talked about that last week. But this hope is certain. It is not, well, I hope so. It is we have a hope of certainty of what Jesus has promised, of what God has promised. And that was even just from the New Testament. There are promises all throughout the Old Testament as well. God makes promises, and he keeps them. And he uses the prayers of the people to even bring them out. And that's what's mind-boggling, mind-blowing, that God is outside of time, and we are inside of it, and get the privilege of being a part of his plan, knowing that we have hope of this salvation that will come to pass. What a glorious God we serve. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We do thank you for this hope. And Lord, if there is anyone within the sound of my voice that doesn't have this hope, that this hope is not something that they have, make it new to them. Father, help, their, help them to understand within their hearts that they are sinners. And the only salvation is by grace through the saving work of Christ on the cross and uh, and he died and then was raised again from the dead so that one day we might rise. Father, help them to turn from their sin to salvation, understanding that, that God and Jesus is the only way for eternal life for them. And it is by faith. Father, we thank you for all that you've done. And we know that we can dwell in this hopeful that the world just does not have. We do thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 151.
again this morning, church, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Lord, he was raised from the dead, and he descended into hell. Lord, he ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, who will come again, from the dead, to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 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 the
Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.